So welcome to this morning's AS English live lesson. I would like to continue on from where we left off last week, which was looking at some sample candidate responses to answers. So we had already looked at um, passages. We looked at passages and a sample response um, to that, as well as the examiner's comments. And today I'd like to look at directed writing, because that will also form part of your paper one exam. And good morning to those of you who have just joined. <laughs> okay, now let's share screen. There we go. Good. Okay. And then let me just put the chat box down here so you can ask me questions if you want to. And just move this over here. Okay, good. All right, so um, as I mentioned, we're going to continue looking at paper one example candidate responses. Today, because we're looking at directed writing, I want to look at a directed writing piece that somebody produced to a question two of this sample paper. Um, last week, we looked at a question 1A. Today, I'd like to look at question 2B. Okay. So this is based on the October-November 2016 exam. And let's have a look at what this is all about. So let me just, um, I don't know if I can make this a bit bigger. No, I think I'll just keep it that size. All right, so the following extract is from The Art of Travel by Alain de Botton. Now, Alain de Botton is a philosopher and author. Okay, you don't need to know that, but you can tell just by the title of the work that he has produced that he is probably educated in some way. The art of travel. Traveling is an art form. Okay. Then look, let's look at the directed writing question. Later in his travels, Alain de Botton takes a journey in your own country. Write the opening of the passage between 120 and 150 words in which he describes this experience. Base your answer closely on the style and language of the original passage. So this is typical of a directed writing question. It's all about style and language. Okay remember that you will have a word limit. So before we focus on answering that, let's look at the original extract and get a sense for the way that this philosopher slash author writes and how he phrases ideas and what he does when he describes things. Awakening early on that first morning, I slipped on a dressing gown provided by the hotel and went out onto the veranda. In the dawn light, the sky was a pale gray blue and, after the rustlings of the night before, all the creatures and even the wind seemed in deep sleep. It was as quiet as a library. Beyond the hotel room stretched a wide beach, which was covered at first with coconut trees and then sloped unhindered towards the sea. I climbed over the veranda's low railing and walked across the sand. Nature was at her most benevolent, at her kindest. It was as if, in creating this small horseshoe bay, she had chosen to atone to make up for her ill temper in other regions, and decided for once to display only her munificence, only her generosity. The trees provided shade and milk, the floor of the sea was lined with shells, the sand was powdery and the color of sun-ripened wheat, and the air, even in the shade, had an enveloping, profound warmth to it, so unlike the fragility of northern European heat, always prone to seed to give in, even in midsummer, to a more assertive, proprietary chill, or, um, ordinary or routine kind of chill, a customary, a customary kind of a chill. Okay, so that's what happens in Northern Europe. Obviously the writer is not in Northern Europe here. I found a deck chair at the edge of the sea. I could hear small lapping sounds beside me, as if a kindly monster was taking discreet sips of water from a large goblet. A few birds were waking up and beginning to career through the air in matinal excitement, in morning excitement, um, morning as in the day, daytime. Behind me, the raffia roofs of the hotel bungalows were visible through gaps in the trees. 
Before me was a view that I recognized from the brochure. The beach stretched away in a gentle curve towards the tip of the bay. Behind it were jungle-covered hills, and the first row of coconut trees inclined irregularly towards the turquoise sea, as though some of them were craning their necks to catch a better angle of the sun. Yet this description only imperfectly reflects what occurred within me that morning, for my attention was in truth far more fractured and confused than the foregoing paragraph suggest. I may have noticed a few birds careering through the air in matinal excitement, but my awareness of them was weakened by a number of other incongruous, when something is incongruous, it doesn't quite fit, it's out of place, by other incongruous and unrelated elements. Among these, a sore throat that I had developed during the flight, a worry at not having informed a colleague that I would be away, a pressure across both temples, and a rising need to visit the bathroom. A momentous, but until then overlooked fact, was making its first appearance that I had inadvertently, without intention, brought myself with me to the island. Okay, so he ends on a humorous idea here that um, the human factor has come into this equation, this getaway, this art of travel piece that he has created, and that is himself. The fact that he is human, he's in his beautiful surroundings, but uh, <laughs> he's not feeling so good. All right. So let's look at um, the question again. Later in his travels, so after he has written this piece, Alain de Bouton takes a journey in your own country. Now, it doesn't matter if you didn't write about South Africa, as long as it's a place you know about. Write the opening of the passage, roughly between 120 and 150 words, in which he describes this experience where he takes a journey in your own country. Base your answer closely on the style and language of the original passage. So the first thing that should, um, you should always be alerted to when you start reading, reading an extract is the way that the author or the writer expresses themselves. I would argue that this philosopher um, uses quite convoluted um, descriptions uh, and roundabout ways of describing something or of saying something indirectly perhaps. Um, so you'd have to try and replicate that. And the way to best do that is to read through this entire um, description again, breaking it down into um, noticeable points. Like, for example, it was as quiet as a library. This point here. Ah, oh, that's a nice simile that he's using. Maybe you could use something similar to that, but not that particular simile, but you know that he uses similes. Um, he uses quite grand words at one point, this benevolence, this kindness of nature, her munificence, her generosity, um, the way that he describes nature is quite detailed and eloquent sounding. Um, he's very observational. He watches what's going on around him. And he uses quite a bit of personification. I mean, look at this. Uh, and the first row of coconut trees inclined irregularly towards the turquoise sea as though some of them were craning their necks. Do coconut trees have necks that they can crane, like a human would crane their neck around to look at something? Okay, no. So this use of personification is there. Um, there was another one, this, uh, this um, as if the sea was a, these lapping sounds, as if a kindly monster was taking discreet sips of water from a large goblet. Describe the sound of the sea lapping against the shore. So these kinds of things you could pick up on, and you could try to replicate in your own original way so that it sounds like Alain Bouton is rewriting or was writing a new um, paragraph or a new description on somewhere else he has gone, particularly your country. Right. So let's have a look at this answer. And forgive me if I can't read all of it straight away. The first rays of sunlight had just begun to kiss the peaks around me as I huddled outside my tent, clutching my parka about me. Okay, so the examiner liked this because it was an atmospheric opening, which is cleverly contrasted with that of the passage. The choice of huddled and clutching is particularly effective. They've used interesting words, and they've um, they've kind of um, created an atmosphere in the beginning 
of their passage just as the writer did at the beginning of this passage. Awakening early on the first morning, I slept on the dressing gown in the dawn light, the sky was pale, rustlings of the night fall, creatures, the wind, and they tried to do something very similar. First rays of sunlight, the peaks around me, huddled outside my tent, clutching my pot. Okay, so clothing and scenery taken into account, right? The sky was still dark, but streaks of blazing orange were creeping along the snow-capped mountains. And this was a use of personification, cleverly reflecting that this author, this is typically something the author does, they use um, personification in relation, to, in relation to the actions or the sounds or the movements that nature makes. The howls of the nighttime winds had been replaced by the gentle swishing of the rhododendrons, silhouettes like wizened old men, bent and shrunken, uh, bent and shrunken, full stop. Okay. So the examiner liked number three, which is the onomatopoeia, the gentle swishing. You can hear the sound of the wind, there's swish, swish of the plants moving in the wind. And that's why it's on a matter pair. And this echoes the use of rustling and lapping in the original passage. So swishing is similar to the rustling, lapping, okay, in terms of a sound that is made by nature. All right, so um, the examiner like that. And what were these silhouettes of these uh, moving bushes doing? Well, they were compared to wizened old men bent and shrunken, okay? And this is quite a striking image to describe these moving bushes outside the tent like wise and old men who were bent and shrunken. So this writer obviously has a lot of control over their vocabulary, a control over creating imagery, which is very good. The silence seemed almost enchanted. Also pulling on this idea of silence, the silence seemed almost enchanted, as if Mother Nature dared not break her self-imposed silence. A silence more profound, this word does echo a word, was used in the original, um, a silence more profound than those of the shadows that glide across the slopes around me. Wow, what an interesting image. Notice the use of alliteration, which I was not as aware of in the first extract, although we could possibly find some if we reread it. But it's, it's a clever use of alliteration. Silence seemed, self-imposed silence. Okay. And this, the silence is repeated, um, the silence more profound than those of the shadows that glide across the slopes around me. What a beautiful, beautiful image that is created there. So we could, up to this point, really believe that Alain de Botton was writing this extract, this passage. As my senses sharpened, so here now drawing more towards the inward looking um, aspect, because this is the outward looking aspect and that's what happened in the extract. The, the writer examined what was going on around him and then a realization of the human factor appears. And, and this student has reflected that. As my senses sharpen, here's a deliberate change of tone, which reflects that of the passage, I hear the playful babble of a nearby brook, and the wind announces its return with a deathly chill, as in he is getting cold or she is getting cold. Suddenly, my stomach interrupts this silent, um, this silent symphony with an ominous growl. <laughs> what a nice uh, expression there, an ominous growl. Even in paradise, it seems hunger calls. Okay, the examiner liked this because it was cleverly, it cleverly achieved a pathetic, a bathetic effect. So bathos. And when you have bathos, it's kind of a working up of this beautiful idea, and then it falls. There's a fall in ideas because something brings you back to reality with a bump. Okay, so that's bathos. So this beautiful setting, and then, then what happens? The stomach growls. Okay. <laughs> Hunger, rather than a sense of danger or alienation, creates the change of tone. And so it was very well done. And this was um, awarded a mark of 9 out of 10, which is 
very, very good. So how could the candidate have improved the answer? This was a fluent response with excellent understanding of the stylistic features of the extract, but it might have been more interesting had it created a more independent narrative. So maybe it too closely reflects the original is what is being said here. Although I would argue that that's completely subjective. Candidates were invited to write the opening of a passage based closely on the style and language of the extract, but the specification did not demand that the shape and development of the passage were to be replicated. Okay, so they didn't like that there was the outward inward, but I think that was good. I would not have a problem with that. So here is a revelation. Marking, marking is completely subjective as long as you are within roughly the guidelines that are expected. The response would have benefited from a stronger contrast of settings. And even though the change of tense and tone worked very well, there was no need to follow the exact shape of the original. So once again, bringing back the same, making the same point. I personally did not have a problem with that. I thought it was clever because it really did sound like the original author was at work here <laughs> in the way that he brought that human factor in at the end. What other way could you do it? Yeah. That's my question. But okay, that was that examiner. Let's have a look at another one. Let's have a look at um, somebody who got a sort of a, a medium, uh, sort of a mid-range mark. Um, it was absolute magnificence, the type of beauty that could not be depicted in a few simple words. It was a late, dusty African afternoon as I sat on the balcony of a tourist-based hotel. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. There are two points have been made by the examiner. Number one, a direct and emphatic opening sentence which recalls the style of the original. So they get straight to the point, there's emphasis on where they are, what they're doing, and so that reflects it, so the examiner liked it. And then number two, um, this tourist-based hotel, it's a mundane detail, unimportant, which seems out of place. I don't think the original author would have talked about a tourist-based hotel. They would have described it in some other more imaginative way, I think. Okay, so as I sat on the balcony of a tourist-based hotel, sipping an ice-cold drink. This echoes, I slipped on a dressing gown in the passage, but isn't really necessary. Candidates are asked to respond Candidates are asked to respond using the style and language of the passage. They don't need to replicate the situation. I think the situation here is far too close to what was going on in the original passage. That I would agree with. Because at least in the previous one where the students scored highly, they were in a mountainous setting in a tent. Here it's yet again on a balcony at a hotel um, sipping on a drink. Okay, so it's not very, um, it's too close to the original. Okay. I sat on the balcony of a tourist-based hotel sipping an ice-cold drink. The bush that surrounded every aspect of my vision was thick and dense, apart from small clearings where I spotted numerous animals busily scurrying about. The burnt orange-colored sun cast colors across the sky that portrayed a water-colored painting done by a famous artist I studied in college, outlining the pure beauty and enjoyment experienced by many in this beautiful country. Um, the examiner said that this was an overlong and clumsy sentence which tries too hard to echo the description of the island's colors. So this, this student has really focused very specifically on um, the kind of the way that the author described a particular part of the island and they've tried to mirror it so closely that it, but it fails, doesn't quite do what it's meant to do. It was not something you would be able to experience anywhere else in the world. I stared in amazement at the herds of elephants that stumbled. And here, um, the marker did not like the word stumble, but we'll get back to that. I stared in amazement at the herds of elephants that stumbled barely five meters away from where I sat, through and over trees and bushes, watching the utter control they assumed over the surrounding so stumbled. An odd choice of verb which doesn't tally or map with the utter control mentioned later on in the sentence. So if they're stumbling, then how can they have utter control? Okay. And then number six, 
in this, this is ending in the spirit of the original, but it is very improbable if read literally that these elephants just stumbled into an area and took control of it. Um, it just sounds unlikely, according to the examiner. So how the candidate could have improved the answer? This response made a purposeful attempt to replicate the style and language of the original, but could have been more confident in developing its own independent narrative. And this was the ideas of having your own ideas, recreating a setting, but it doesn't necessarily have to be so close to the original. With a stipulated word boundary of 150 words, the writing needs to be succinct, precise, concise. The phrase, a watercolored painting done by a famous artist I studied in college added little to the description of the colors of the African sky. Which, which painting? Why did it remind you of that? What colors? So it was too vague and unlikely. Bearing the word restriction in mind, it might have been better to have devoted the whole passage to its most dramatic feature, the herd of elephants. Okay, so this got a six out of ten. We've got seven minutes left. Let's look at the last one. Um, I don't even know if we'll have time to. Let me just see here. Okay, I'm going to read very, very quickly. And I won't um, try not to comment too much. Just getting out the airport parking lot, we drove into Johannesburg City. The atmosphere and all my surroundings were dipped in culture. The sky is blue and more clear than the crystal and the uh, tall, tainted buildings. Tall, tall, painted buildings, or tainted, as I can't see were screaming their history. As we drove, we entered more towards the heart and soul of Joburg. We were in the towns and streets. People were joyous, though some were not. Every language spoken containing so much heritage. Okay, examiner says several very awkward sentences in which either the construction is faulty or the meaning is uncertain. The qualification here, some were not joyous, is given no context and the sentence has no logical progression. Some are joyous, some are not. Well, why not? So give us more information. Describe what's going on. Children running with soccer balls on the fields and women with babies strapped to their backs watching them. Even the air spoke a new language. And the, the writer like this, a plausible echo of the original style, the air spoke a new language, that's clever. And as we um, drove, I was only but excited to experience the city as much as it allows me to, there's a tense change here, allowed me to. We entered the suburban areas where greenery filled the scenes. Houses upon houses and shopping malls galore. It felt as if I were in a completely different city now. And with that thought in mind, I have come to learn that she was a bipolar city. And the Dana said this was an interesting development of the contrasting moods of the passage. So remember how the previous passage was a contrast. There was um, sort of this admiration of nature and then there was an inward looking sort of call to reality. Here, the contrast is created but in a very different or interesting way. This um, sort of lively city, but then actually the city is bipolar, has more than one sort of attitude or mood that it can take on. Um, so in my, in my, my, in my choice, uh, in my choice, something, I'm not sure what that says. In my choice upon which personality I wanted to know more about, in front of me lay a pool of opportunity. It is upon me. Okay, thank you. In front of me lay a pool of opportunity. There, This metaphor echoes the language of the text and gives the response quite a purposeful conclusion, this idea of a pool of opportunity. But this person only got four out of 10, so it's not even quite a pass. Um, how the candidate could have improved the answer? There was an attempt to introduce elements of the text style and language to the response, but the effect was very variable and accuracy of expression suffered in the process. I don't feel that, I couldn't quite believe that Alain de Bouton would write that passage. Didn't feel like his style of writing. The first paragraph would have benefited from a clear sense of the atmosphere the candidate was trying to create. In the answer, the images of screaming buildings and surroundings dipped in culture seemed disconnected and arbitrary, there by chance. There was not enough meaning behind it. There was not enough description behind it. The second paragraph had a greater sense of cohesion. It stuck more um, clearly together. 
together with a purposeful conclusion. But the more matter of fact style bore little resemblance to the original. Children playing football in the fields, mothers with babies on their backs, full stop. You didn't really see the original author doing that. There were significant errors of expression throughout the response, which with careful checking, remember those last 10 minutes that you have to edit things, with careful checking would ha could have been improved. You could have written sentences more fully, inserted words in places, um, checked spelling, all of that kind of thing. So time management is very, very important. I'm now going to try to read this conclusion to you of um, the overall remarks, the comment, um, the examiner made on these um, answers, okay. So common mistakes candidates made in this question. This question produced some interesting and imaginative work, but certain elements of the style of the text were not reproduced. The most obvious feature of the passage, the personification of the natural world, was generally understood and replicated. Alliteration was another feature that was commonly included, but other aspects of the writing tended to be ignored. In attempting to replicate the quirky imagery of the text, some candidates produced images which were weak or simply eccentric. They went too overboard. The major problem proved to be an unwillingness to depart too far from the structure of the original text. This sometimes resulted in rather contrived responses and also inhibited the candidate's capacity to produce a strongly personal account of an event in their own country. So in other words, students were sticking too closely to you know, the, the format of the, of the original text, where it was just language and style that perhaps is what the examiner is looking for here. In the low example, the candidate significantly exceeded the specified word limit, while transgression of the word limit does not directly result in the deduction of marks. This script is an example of how a lack of conciseness can be self-penalizing. So they did deduct marks here because it wasn't as though it was good writing that had extended in a, a little bit. It was weak writing that, that, that rambled on. And so um, it shows a lack of control in thought and ideas and in, um, and in sentence structure as well. Okay, 